Well, welcome everyone. Um, today's webinar, like all webinars, is being recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing through geodynamics.org. During the webinar, please use the chat window to type in your questions or communicate with others directly. During the Q&A session at the end of the talk, please either indicate in the chat window or turn on your microphone that you have questions. But again, during the presentation, please keep your microphone muted and again, ask a question via the chat window. For today's webinar, we are very fortunate to have Professor Carolina Lithgow Bertoloni, who is the Louis B. and Martha B. Slichter Endowed Chair in Geosciences at UCLA. I'll keep the introduction brief, but I will say that Carolina is a geodynamicist in the truest sense, as her research cover, covers topics ranging everywhere from tectonic plate reconstructions, the dynamics of mantle convection, the state of stress in the lithosphere, the seismology, and mineral physics. Today, Carolina will be discussing the thermodynamics code Hephaesto, which provides a robust platform for self-consistently predicting nanophase assemblages and their equilibrium properties. And with that, Carolina, the screen is all yours. Uh, yes, uh, hello. I, I guess uh, I, I'm, I'm really pleased to do this. I've never done a webinar before, so it's going to be slightly odd not to have an audience and talk to myself, uh, you know, a live audience. Um, I just wanted to make sure that everyone can see the screen. Uh, is that, uh, John, do you have a sense that everyone can see the screen? Yes, it looks like everyone can see the screen. Okay, fantastic, fantastic, yes. Okay, it's a, a, as, as John knows, it's a, because I'm doing uh, two devices at once because I want to show you how to run the code and I also, I'm also using my iPad for the presentation so that I can draw on them. Right, so, so I'll, I'll delve right in. Um, and first of all, I really should acknowledge um, uh, the fact that I'm, I'm really speaking about stuff that I've done with Lars Stixrud, who's a mineral physicist. And I'll give you a sense for the history of how and why we, we did this. And, but I'll start with a little bit of an introduction as to the why. And as John said, I'm really interested in you know, everything from the surface deformation that you see in places like uh, Tibet and the state of stress to what is driving that deformation. And you know, we, we look at this and we can see that there is a great deal of um, heterogeneity in the morphology of the surface from uh, trenches, uh, right? Uh, the fact that the ocean floor as it goes towards the trench gets deeper uh, to the great deal of heterogeneity that you see on the continent. And uh, you know, we want to understand this. And if we overlay on this, actually, the uh, ages of the rocks that we see, we can see, you know, very distinct patterns between oceans and continents with, you know, continents having a great deal of, a great deal of variability in terms of the rocks, um, the rock ages, you know, from really old to quite young. And instead of the oceans, a progression from zero age to, you know, very old ages um, and much younger. Right. And this uh, age distribution, you know, is already part of what we, you know, helped us understand plate tectonics and come up with the kinematic theory of plate tectonics. But it also reveals something much deeper. And what it reveals that is deeper has to do with the fact that there is not only morphological heterogeneity like we saw before, but lithological heterogeneity. And what is the explanation for such heterogeneity, right? Uh, when you see the ages of the ocean going from zero to, uh, you know, 180 million years, you know, it's in vogue, well in vogue, we've always said, oh, that's the expression of mantle convection. You know, an idea that goes all the way back to Holmes in 1945, right, that we can do today with things like CIG is really good at, even though this isn't a CIG code uh, simulation here, which is uh, 3D simulations of uh, the governing equations for the mantle, right? But in Holmes, there is an element uh, to it that has to do with what I said before in terms of the lithological heterogeneity. Not only does he have, you know, convection, right, in the mantle um, operating, 
and uh, inducing deformation at the surface, but he also has an element that has to do with lithological heterogeneity, right? The creation of oceanic crust um, that then forms the mantle, I mean, sorry, forms the oceanic lithosphere, which then will go down as uh, we go on. There are other things that are not quite right, but you know, it gives you a sense uh, for the fact that that expression of mantle convection at the surface is actually a lot more than that. It's a system that it's coupled together so that both thermal and lithological heterogeneity originating from the mantle are critical to the operation of mantle convection and uh, plate tectonics. In fact, you know, one of the goals, I think, you know, certainly for mantle dynamics and for a lot of deep earth geophysics today is to really to try to understand the origin of heterogeneity, right? Um, as well as how that heterogeneity relates uh, to uh, a mantle convection, uh, to uh, seismic images and therefore uh, to mantle convection. Um, so, as you see here in this uh, in this picture of you know sort of a simulation of the delamination of uh, the basaltic crust uh, from uh, from the slabs and a seismic tomographic picture. And so, let me go back to that idea of the compositional heterogeneity because it's really central uh, to Hephaesto and why why we went out uh, to do this um, you know more than twenty years ago now. And it is what I mentioned about that it's in Holmes' picture of convection and is the element of the compositional heterogeneity that you get on the formation of new oceanic crust. And that's actually really important, right? It's really important because every time you go at the mid-ocean ridge, the mantle sort of outcrops uh, to the surface, it melts, right? And melting because of the way rocks are, is um, never full, it's always partial. And that partial melting means that you're generating material, the basalt, right? That has a different composition from the source and it also leaves behind something that has a different composition. So both the product of melting, the basaltic crust, and the residuum now have a very different composition from the original uh, source of the material. And because this package forms the oceanic lithosphere, you re-enter it back into the mantle as subduction zones and therefore continuously changing the compositional and thermal structure of the mantle. And so the system is completely coupled in that way. Therefore, to really understand both mantle dynamics, uh, seismic heterogeneity, and how the two relate to each other, you really need to understand the process of formation of the rocks, and in particular, the physical properties. And you can see it uh, here, for example, in the, um, you know, this is a picture of a rock, right? Actually, it's a sump roxanite. I've forgot, I've forgotten exactly from where, okay? And it is the, the fact that, you know, rocks are made of multiple minerals in equilibrium and that uh, equilibrium of the multiple minerals, this multiple phase assemblages, you know, has an effect on the physical properties that are going to be relevant for convection. Okay, so this is borrowed from the aspect manual, you know, the code that, uh, you know, CIG has helped, uh, you know, the I, let's say help develop. Um, and so these are the equations that govern, uh, you know, the equations of motion in the mantle. So you have um, the conservation of momentum, right? So there's that. You can see that I love my new iPad. Okay, <laughs> the conservation of mass and the conservation of energy. Now, without going into all the terms, you know, you probably know them uh, just as well, right? Just notice that there are lots of things in here, right, that crucially depend on the material properties, right? The ones that you care about mostly as dynamicists are things like viscosity, right? Okay, you also care about things like thermal diffusivity, um, right there, okay? And there are other properties such as the thermal expansion uh, right there, okay? Now, all these properties, right, affect convection, right, some more than others, okay? But they're all related to the thermodynamics that determine what is the stable phase assemblage of the system, right? Okay, now in, in sort of perhaps simpler terms, without this, which is the thermal expansion, right, you wouldn't have convection, 
right? So thermal expansion is the uh, is defined as you see in this uh, uh, particular uh, in this particular slide, right? As the change of uh, density of the system or the change of volume of the system with respect to temperature, right? A constant pressure. And you see it defined here as these are the logarithmic derivatives, which are very common in thermodynamics, a constant pressure right there, right? Um, so it's a change in volume, or you can do it as the change in density. So this with a negative sign in front, okay? Usually the thermal expansion is positive, right? That's why you get convection, because as you heat up the material, such as right here, uh, it will become less dense, so it will want to rise because, uh, you know, because of gravity. So just that element of it makes knowing the material properties very, very significant and very, very important uh, for mantle dynamics um, in general. So uh, with that in mind, then I, I would say that the lofty goals we had in mind, Lars and I, uh, of Hephaestus was really to try to come up with a way to, you know, sort of robustly um, get at what are the minerals that are stable in the mantle and what are their properties and how do they affect dynamics. So let me take you back a little bit historically through this. Uh, Lars and I were in grad school together. That's where we met. And, uh, you know, Lars was doing quantum mechanical simulations of materials. Um, but he was also very into thermodynamics. And he had written a paper uh, with his advisor, Mark Bukowinski, actually on water. Right? He developed a thermodynamic formalism, uh, just applied to water. And then he had a paper, uh, I think it might have been 1990, Stixter and Bukowinski, um, where they looked at diopside. Um, and so, you know, these were not the early days of seismic tomography, the sort of early 90s, but was with, when seismic tomography was really sort of coming at, into its own, if you wish, right? And because in this formalism, he could compute certain physical properties, you know, I was already thinking, great, you know, we could actually um, try to come up with a way to convert the seismic velocities that you see to density so that I could compute all sorts of cool things, right? So if I know the density field of the earth, I can compute the flow field, right? If I know the physical properties, I can compare to seismology. So it took me um, about 10 years to convince Lars that it was worthwhile to extend the uh, thermodynamic formalism in a way that we could do this. I would say that the intervening time, uh, for those of you that have looked at the papers, he wrote a few other pa papers, one in 92 and one in 94, uh, with Joel Ida, where they'd already tried to uh, sort of take the phase assemblages that people thought were in the mantle and compute the physical properties. So that is sort of the history and sort of the also the idea behind you know, sort of a person like me who started in geodynamics, trying to do some mineral physics, if you wish. Right. So if I give it to you in sort of, uh, you know, the simplest possible terms, right? When Lars wrote this paper with Joe Elida in 1992, they took uh, published uh, results on what phase assemblages were stable in the mantle, what minerals at different pressures and temperatures, given the limitations of the data at the time, constructed um, a phase diagram for the mantle. And then from that, they computed the physical properties with the thermodynamic formalism Lars had at the time. Okay, so you know, you take something like phase equilibria, in that case, he took it from the literature, right? And combine it with his formalism for physical properties. But we wanted something more, right? We wanted to say now, okay, now let's try to do this in a way that we could take any bulk composition, right? So whatever the rocks are made of, right? Whether it's a basalt or a peroxinite or, you know, uh, you know, a made up rock like pyrolite, whatever, and, uh, and then compute the phase equilibria, no longer take it just from experiment, but compute it at any pressure and temperature that you want, right? And then compute the physical properties that are consistent, right? Consistent 
with that phase equilibria. So what I'm fond of saying is that the upper part right here, this is what's traditionally in the realm of petrology. And the bottom part is what is traditionally in the realm of mineral physics. Right? So once you do that, uh, oops, they disappeared. Okay, well, once you do that, you can compute uh, the physical properties, right? Rho, alpha, CP, so the density, the thermal expansion, the heat capacity, um, and then also the elastic properties of the material so that you can compare to seismology, which is you know, some of the things I am going to um, talk about next. Okay, so that was the idea, right? Rewrite that original formalism, which could do, you know, sort of the bulk modulus, for example, and maybe a simple way, not even the shear modulus at the time, okay? Combine it with ideas from how to calculate the phase equilibrium petrology and come up with a full thermodynamic model of the mantle for any arbitrary composition uh, that you could do. Okay, so if you wanna hear nothing else, today, this, is, this can be the last slide for you, okay? And so what we came up with what is a code uh, called Hefesto, okay? Now that's a very strange hybrid, both in pronunciation and spelling, because uh, uh, Hephaestus is the, it's the Roman uh, god of, of fire, right? And, but in Romance languages like mine, um, it's not spelled with PH, it's spelled with an F. And so, uh, you know, so I would pronounce this Efesto, right? Because we don't aspire our H. So, but, you know, sort of combination of English and so on, this is pronounced Hephaesto. Uh, it is, you know, the Lord uh, or the God of fire. Okay, and what does it stand for? Because that's important. It's part of the thermodynamic formalism underneath it. It starts for Helmholtz, free energy, self-consistent thermodynamics. Okay, and it's based on, I'll explain in a minute, a very simple idea that you can write a fundamental thermodynamic relation, okay, that describes the entire system, okay, and once you've written that, you can do it in terms of what are called thermodynamic potentials, okay, and there are different thermodynamic potentials, there's the internal energy, for example, there's the enthalpy, um, the two we'll be concerned with mostly are the Gibbs free energy and the Helmholtz free energy, and we'll see why in a minute. You can see it on the, on the Gibbs free energy immediately because you will remember from petrology if you've taken it that uh, minimizing the Gibbs free energy tells you which minerals are stable at which pressure and temperature, right? So you see here, this is the Gibbs free energy right here. Um, it's the sum over all the species. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and what you have here, this is the chemical potential, which is the chemical driving force for reaction. And this is the activity uh, that determines which of the phases are going to come in. You're gonna have this very special constraint, which is that the fixed the fix bulk composition, you're not gonna allow uh, that to change. And you have uh, you know, uh, said earlier what the bulk composition is. But I think the big, big innovation, because something like the Gibbs free energy minimization is in codes like melts, for example, um, uh, and you know, certainly in codes like perplex uh, and so on, that we'll, you see in a minute, okay? Um, but the big, big innovation, and this goes back to a reformed mineral physicist, okay? Jeff Davis um, started out as a mineral physicist at Caltech, and in fact, wrote a seminal paper in, the, in 1974-75. At the time, there really was not enough data to do it. But what he did is that he generalized what is known as the Birchman again, finite strain, uh, anisotropically, right? So Birchman again, finite strain, a finite strain, you know, it's a, it's a change in shape. You can do it in terms of volume and you don't have to define in terms of volume. You can define in terms of the strain tensor, right? And so you can then take the derivative of the Helmholtz free energy, which will be your thermodynamic formulation with respect to the strain tensor right here, the second derivative, right? And that will give you 
every individual elastic constant that you need to compute seismic velocities. So what that means is that our code in principle, so he did that and we adapted that and we added something to it as I'll show you in a minute. Okay, so we adapted what he did to do the full anisotropic generalization of the thermodynamic potentials of interest, both the Gibbs free energy and the Helmholtz free energy. And why is that powerful? That is powerful because in principle, then you can compare directly, not to an average of the moduli, but actually elastic constants directly that you get from seismology. Okay, there are, as we said, many, you know, some previous approaches, as you will see, um, and, but the anisotropic generalization is really quite unique uh, to our work and very powerful. And recently we published the first paper um, using it to look at um, uh, apparent anisotropy. Okay, now uh, here is the uh, sort of the, the big thing, uh, taking inspiration from Rene, Rene Gensmuller's um, presentation at CIDR last, uh, last year. Um, we decided to put Hefesto on GitHub. And uh, so there it is, and there's the link. And now you can scurry away and go and try and get it. Okay, and here are two other examples, Perplex, which also does phase equilibria, and Berman, which was also written at CIDR, um, which actually takes, uh, you know, whatever phases you want to combine them together and calculates the physical properties using our uh, formulation. So this perplex, by the way, perplex has different ways of doing it, but in perplex, a lot of people just choose uh, to use our parameters and our physical properties to calculate, uh, and our formulation to calculate the physical properties, in particular the shear modulus, as we'll see in a second. Now, just a word, um, this is really in testing mode, so it has zero documentation at the moment. Um, but you can try, download, and try to compile it and see how it goes, and also, um, you know, and, and, and try, and we are help, happy to help you um, with that process. Okay, now, um, I am going to do a little bit in terms of the thermodynamics that went behind it and then try to give you an example of why this is interesting and important for dynamics. But I think the most important thing I can do for you in terms of thermodynamics is refer you to Lars's truly excellent lectures on thermodynamics and modeling planetary materials. Um, at the in the you know in the cider repository, okay, um, and the two papers that uh, we've published on the theory, they're both in Geophysical Journal International. Um, in one in two thousand five that talks about how we do the physical properties. That's the one that's most intense mathematically. The one in two thousand eleven, it's about the phase equilibria. Mostly, and so that's more intense in terms of the chemistry and uh, uh, understanding uh, things of that nature. Okay, so, right, so I wanna show you, okay, so now we are going to try the, um, okay, now I'm going to try to share something else with you. So let's see if I can do it. Okay, and would be would uh, you be so kind to let me know, John, that people can see the new screen? Yes, we can see it, but um, the um, keynote is um, um, is on top of the. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. That, that's okay. how it is right now. So okay. okay. So I I want to show you once the code is compiled. So just a second, and then I'll go back to the presentation. Okay. So as I said, the code is in GitHub, GitHub, okay? So there's Hefesto repository. You can see it on the left-hand side over here, right here, right? Okay. Um, and, and you'll see some other things in here. The code, uh, there will be a, a source directory, um, which I have moved around because I like to move things around. Um, okay, but the code, you know, you compile it with a crime file. Actually, I should be able to. Go there. Yes, there it is. This is the code. The code is written in Fortran 77. Uh, both Lars and I are old, and so we learned Fortran 77, and we've stuck with it. Okay, 
and there is a make file to compile it. Uh, the compilers are all new compilers, so you shouldn't need anything else. It is faster on Intel compilers, but you know, um, it, it is what it is. So once you compile, it makes uh, an executable called main, right? Okay. And then there is an input file, uh, which is called control. Um, and in the control file, what you see, and then, you know, this will make more sense in a minute. You'll see a top line, right, that uh, tells you, and I'll show you something else in a minute as well, okay, that tells it, tells the code to basically do the calculation. Um, starting at zero pressure, that's the first number, going all the way to the core mental boundary, okay, it tells it in how many steps, that tells you what resolution uh, you might want in terms of the pressure steps. Okay, and then uh, comes the temperature, right? So you could also do steps in temperature. So you could start at some temperature. The, the code is in Kelvin, by the way. Okay, and here would be a second temperature, and here would be the delta T. So you could do isotherms, right? So you could see, say, I don't know, 300 to 2000 K every 50 K. Okay, so you could make a big, nice lookup table for yourself. And then you see there are a few other numbers here. There are three zeros at the end. Okay, so with these three zeros, you're, at, you're actually going to tell the code what thermodynamic ensemble to use. Okay, and what does that mean? That means that I could do something at constant temperature, that I could do something along a constant entropy, and, uh, uh, and the other one is to um, actually read in uh, a constant entropy file, which is an adiabat. Okay, so the code will calculate for you not only the phase assemblage and the physical properties, but also the self-consistent adiabat. Okay, I will show you uh, some of the, um, you know, some of the actual values that you'd put in there. At the moment, I don't want to do anything. I just want to calculate at 1600 uh, over the mantle. Then you have some information here, 6242. The 6 corresponds to the oxides. Uh, so that corresponds to the bulk composition. And, uh, and then some of these numbers now I've forgotten. I think they have to do with, you know, sort of kind of how you want to do the compositional steps. Um, you know, we don't use them. And, uh, okay, so you can see the oxides. So every composition uh, in the code at the moment is represented by the six oxides, SiO2, MgO, FeO, um, CaO, Al2O3, and Na2O. Okay, so it's got sodium. And so, uh, for example, and this is pretty standard in petrology. Um, the numbers you see here, these are moles, right? So that represents the composition. You'd be more uh, used to seeing this in weight percent, which is how it is in most petrology or geochemical codes. Um, but it should come with a code that actually takes the weight percent information and computes the molar percentages that the thermodynamic code wants. This line right here, which is 1111, refers to the type of theory used for the thermal part of the code. All of this will become obvious in a second, but I just want how you show, to show it. And then um, there's another line right here, which is critical, and it's not at the moment on GitHub either. This is the source of the parameters that you need for all the individual components and species, okay? And what that means will become, I hope, obvious in a second. And so these come from inverting the data uh, that exists. Um, I'll explain that. And then they have a date, right? And so I think we're up to, I don't know, 128 parameter files, maybe more. Um, and, uh, but the last, the say, so the last uh, published one is from actually 2010. Um, there have been several iterations since, uh, this being the latest, um, but they're not published. <laughs> and so, uh, no one can use them except us at the moment. Um, but we are working on a paper which will supersede the last parameter set, which will also include the spin transitions in MGO and perovskite. Um, so, 
so that's a breaking news I think and we should be submitting that you know not too long in the future and that will have the entire new parameter set and I know Jamie Connolly will take it implement it in perplex but you will also be able to use it with Hephaestus directly and the other thing you see here is you see this number over here 51 right that is the number of species Okay, so there are minerals. Each mineral is a phase. So say here, that's phase plagioclase. Um, phase plagioclase has, you know, two N members, so two species, anorthite and albite, okay, and so on and so forth. And then you see here that there is a number, zero, that's the guess of whether that phase exists to begin with. So one can do the Gibbs free energy minimization appropriately. Okay, so I'm just going to run the code just for a second so you can see what happens. So, so what the code is doing is reading all the parameter files, is reading all the information, and you'll know in a minute what that is. Okay, um, and then if you, it, it's kind of hard to see from here, but down here, the, you know, you see this number 21, 22, that's the pressure. So that's how, how you can tell whether it's advancing fast enough. And then it's telling you whether it's adding phases or subtracting phases. We'll go over that uh, in a minute as well. Okay. Um, right. So I'm going to stop it there. So you'll see that it makes a lot of output. The output contains the phase equilibria uh, right there. So pressure, depth, temperature, and then each phase, and this is the atomic proportions of each phase, uh, these numbers here. So at zero pressure, uh, there is plagioclase, a lot of plagioclase. There is orthopyroxene. Um, there is clinopyroxene, and then, oh, I can't read what that says right there, and then there's all of you, for example, right? And at the core mental boundary, there'll be, you know, or bridgmanite. Okay. And then the, sorry, that's the wrong file. Okay. Then there is this enormous file. This is the file that contains all the physical properties, right? So that's pressure, uh, depth. The pressure depth conversion comes from prem. That's temperature. Okay. Uh, that is density. Uh, that is, you know, and this, you know, it's all spelled out. It's just that the, the, the titles aren't on this file. And then it says succession of things, which is the bulk sound velocity, uh, the shear velocity, the uh, VP, then those corrected for attenuation. And then on column 11, right here is the entropy. Uh, which is very important. Um, and then you can also, it will also tell you what the most abundant phase is at that particular depth, okay? So that's an example of sort of how that works, okay? And now I'm gonna go back to my iPad. Okay, so we should be back on the iPad. Yes, I can see that, perfect, okay. Um, right. Okay. So let me, uh, you know, because we don't have a huge amount of time, I guess I might not cover everything, but let me tell you how, you know, some of the things that are sort of um, important uh, in the code. So we'll start with some knowledge, right? Which is that uh, we uh, know the, you know, you know that the first law of thermodynamics, right? And so the first equation here, right, is a statement of the first law of thermodynamics. Um, uh, based on the internal energy, right? And so you have uh, temperature times the differential of entropy, pressure times the, uh, you know, differential volume, and then this term right here, right, which has to do with summing over the chemical potential of all the species. And by taking derivatives, uh, you know, with respect to entropy, for example, you get temperature. With respect to volume, you get pressure. Uh, with respect to the chemical uh, with respect to the number of the species, you get the chemical potential. So you can take this as a statement on the definition of the pressure and temperature and chemical potentials coming from the first law of thermodynamics. Now you can see that this statement of the first law of thermodynamics is a differential, right? It is actually uh, more useful um, to do in terms of the Euler form. Um, uh, and not to use a differential form. 
right? Because if you use a differential form, you have an arbitrary constant in it. And uh, uh, so it's actually more useful not to do that. Now, the first statement that you see there, that u lambda is a function of lambda s comma lambda v, so entropy and volume, multiplied by some constant, it, equ it equals to lambda um, u of, you know, when u is a function of entropy and volume, it's not just any old uh, function, right? It is only true because entropy and volume are real physical quantities which have very special properties. And if you took some thermodynamics, you know, one of their properties is they're extensive, right? That you can multiply them by something. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that, uh, and that will work, right? Um, so what you do then is for the internal energy, you can take the uh, lambda derivative, uh, so with respect to this, you know, multiplying factor of both sides, right, here and here. So you take the lambda, oh, sorry, <laughs> on the wrong screen. If you take the lambda derivative, right, right here of that side, you just get USV, right? You use the chain rule, okay? And what you get back is the internal energy in an, in an Euler form where du ds is t, right, we saw before. And then you have, this is just the d lambda v, d lambda is just v, right? And that, uh, and du dv is p, okay? So, so great. So plus the sum of the chemical potential. So you have a form that is actually super useful right now. And that form, right, allows you to construct or allows you to say uh, that this is a fundamental thermodynamic relation. Right? And so the internal energy as a function of entropy, volume, entropy, volume, and the number of species is a function that contains complete information of all the properties of all equilibrium states of a system that you decide to use. So that's really important. So compared to, say, melts or other codes, you know, one crucial difference is that our code is formulated in terms of fundamental thermodynamic relations and the non-differential form say, of the first law of thermodynamics. Okay. Here's another thing uh, that the code does, and is that it also, and this will be familiar to seismologists if there are any uh, here at the moment, and, and that is that it does a Legendre transformation, okay? So that you can, uh, you know, transform from one potential to the other, right? Um, and you can see that there is a relationship, right, between the Helmholtz free energy and the Gibbs free energy. And you do this through the Legendre transformations. And you can see, you know, clearly in the relationship there, okay? And then what I mentioned before in the summary slide is this anisotropic generalization so that the uh, Helmholtz free energy is generalized anisotropically with respect to the strain tensor and the Gibbs free energy is generalized and isotropically with respect to the stress tensor. Why? Because this is, these are the natural variables of F, are temperature and volume, temperature and volume, the strain tensor, you know, the, the trace will be the volume, right? And for G, they will, the natural variables will be T and P, and so you can see that's the stress there, right? So the trace of the stress tensor will give you uh, the pressure. Okay, so there's the formulation. Right? And so what the code will do is first, it will calculate the phase equilibria. And so like I said before, the way we'll calculate the phase equilibria is by minimizing uh, the Gibbs free energy. So that's something we know that if you add up the minimum of the Gibbs free energy, you are actually at the stable phase assemblage for any fixed uh, pressure uh, temperature uh, point. Okay, um, so the key to do that, this minimization is hard, right? You can find a lot of sort of bad places to end up in. Um, but one thing that helps is to subject the minimization to the constraint of constant bulk composition. And you'll see in a minute what R and NJ and BI are, right? Um, so that's the bulk composition, that's the stoichiometric position matrix, and that is the vector of components or species. Okay, so what you do to do the minimization, this is by far the hardest part, and you saw it, uh, you saw it when we, when I was uh, running the code, you know, what you saw every time in advance in PNT is that it spent some time trying to compute um, the phase equilibria, 
right? So the stoichiometric coefficient matrix, that's, you know, sort of the uh, chemical formal, uh, formulas, right? This is the vector n, so n sub i is the amount of species, right? The number of species that there are. And here is the constraint of bulk composition. Now, in principle, right, um, there is, this is, so you could look at this, right, and think of it as an inverse problem. Um, it's underdetermined uh, because the number of species is in principle unlimited. And uh, so you can have, okay, so there are 92 stable elements. So in principle, you could have 92 to the 92 combinations. Uh, in our reality, it's more like six, right? And, but the, having a, a constraint to uh, bulk composition being fixed actually reduces uh, the, that null space, okay? And then as you saw in, when the code was running, uh, uh, you can also, when the code was running, you saw that it was adding or checking for the addition or subtraction of phases, right? And so what happens is that you have to check uh, whether that phase is stable, whether the amount is getting close to zero, there is a nonlinearity because there's a log, uh, uh, the, a natural logarithm involved, and so you have to be careful to add and subtract spaces as um, as needed. Okay, so this is where the code spends the most amount of time is doing that minimization. Um, it, an old version of the code does this by quasi Newton iteration. It no longer does that. And uh, you're trying to solve uh, uh, this problem as efficiently as, as you can. Okay, now, so that's the part that has to do with the phase equilibria. And what I'm not going to show you right now, but it was in that, um, you know, sort of summary slide, right, is that you can relate the Gibbs free energy just as much to the physical properties and you can, as you can the Helmholtz free energy uh, thermodynamic potential. Okay, so, so the physical, so the phase equilibria definitely use the Gibbs free energy minimization, right? It has to, okay? The physical properties we formulated in terms of the Helmholtz free energy, um, okay? And why, okay, so this goes all the way back to Birch, uh, well, actually, and others. Okay, it turns out that it's a really, really good way to extrapolate to extreme conditions robustly. Um, so for this is uh, what you see on the picture here, on the right here, right? Uh, pressure as a function of volume. So this is an equation of state uh, for perovskite. For example, the data are the, are the symbols here, are the data, right? This curve right here, it's not a fit to the data, right? This is the finite strain extrapolation from the zero pressure state, right? From the ambient state, okay? And so that's something that the code does really well. So the, what does the finite strain do? It actually, what it does, it, it does a Taylor series expansion, um, where the expansion variable is uh, the volume. And it turns out that that is a really, really good uh, formulation because it converges really quickly. In fact, you see in this image right here that it converges by using the first term in the Taylor series expansion, right? And, uh, it, and also those terms in the Taylor series expansion have physical meaning, right? Uh, you know, sort of, you know, you can get the bulk modulus out of it. And, you know, then you get the pressure derivative of the bulk modulus when you add another term for the Taylor series expansion, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, so, so it's super powerful. It means that you only need to know the zero pressure or the ambient conditions, right? And then the finite strand formulation or how the volume is changing with pressure actually will fit the equation of state data. It will extrapolate beautifully. And strain, right? So this has been known for a long time, and you know, therefore we decided to adopt it. And those first papers I mentioned by Lars, it was you know, sort of using this part. Now you will see here that I've called this the cold part, right? Because first, in this particular case, is along an isotherm, but that's not enough, right? We want the entire mantle, so we have to have also a uh, a thermal side to this, okay? So the full expression for the Helmholtz free energy actually has, you know, sort of 
F0 is uh, the reference free energy, which you actually get from the phase equilibria and you can get from data. Okay, and this is the cold part, which I just show you. There it is, the anisotropic generalization right there. Okay, and it's also a function of the temperature uh, or temperature at ambient and the vector of species that you have. And then this is the thermal part. And I'm not gonna go into the thermal part. Um, it's just to say that we use Grunais and Dubai theory and we'll refer to the papers. That's just, just way too much uh, to go into. Okay, so that contains now the entire phase equilibria and all the physical properties to fully take any composition and go and get uh, uh, you know what you want in terms of which phases are stable and what are their properties that are of interest. Okay, so you should now be seeing a really small table. And in that small table is the, all the species um, that are 51 um, right now. And uh, you should see the formula. Uh, you should see the you know, ambient, uh, sort of the zero pressure free energy term that you get from phase equilibrium experiment. You see the initial volume. You should see the initial bulk modulus, the K prime, K naught, V naught. If not, et cetera, et cetera, you saw before. Now, the, the way the actual code works is that, you know, both Lars and I, but mostly Lars, you compile a ton of information on the phase equilibria and the physical properties, both at ambient condition and pressure, both from experiments and first principles, right? Because not everything is measured, okay? And first principles is really good and it really matches a lot of the data. Now, I just wonder if you can see the pink. I don't know if you can see the pink or not, but in case you can see the pink, uh, those are neither measured nor computed. And so you have to estimate them from systematics of minerals. And as you can see, although the table is filling out nicely, uh, there's still lots and lots of things that we don't actually know. Okay, so what can you do with Hephaestus? Okay, uh, oops, sorry. I it's supposed to oh no okay it's actually supposed to give me the okay i'm gonna have to it's not giving me the sidebar which i need okay this is not good Just to give me this sidebar, okay, I, I will, I'm almost, okay, so it should go back. Yes, my apologies, um, there, okay. Okay, so Hephaestus actually gives you a ton of information, okay? It gives you physical properties, here's the shear modulus. You know, we have in the original 2005 paper, which was in JGR, we actually have an expression for the shear modulus as a function of temperature. It gives you the phase equilibria, you can see there, right? Okay, um, it gives you, this is the bulk modulus right here for Bridgmanite. Okay, we don't have the individual, uh, it gives you more phase equilibrium here of individual phases. This is multi-phase of Mg2SiO4 and FeSiO3. But also it gives you a lot more information. What you see there on the left is actually the composition of individual minerals as a function of pressure. Okay, so if you focus on the blue, Right here, that's garnet. And garnet goes from low pressures, the dark color, to high pressure. And these are lines of constant shear modulus. And you can see that sort of garnet, you know, is really changing in composition. This is a ternary diagram. As it goes from low pressure to high pressure, it loops back on itself. And how the shear modulus is going up and then it's going back down, which is, you know, fascinating. So that's what you can get. You can get a lot more than just VPVS and rubber, right? Uh, I guess that's the point uh, that I'm trying to make here. So here are some phase uh, diagrams for the mantle. I think I might stop uh, pretty soon so you can get a chance to ask questions. Um, and so these are the phase diagrams, so the phase proportions, right? Uh, for four different uh, compositional assemblages. The, uh, the red line, the, the red line is the shear velocity of uh, pyrolite. And the other two lines that you see there are the shear velocity 
of um, Hartsburgite and I think a mechanical mixture of pyrolite as opposed to an equilibrium assemblage. And you can ask me what that means later. But what you can see is like, uh, you know, so if we get to the part about the mantle and I'll skip all the way to the end in a minute, is that the phase proportions, right, are radically different between compositions, right? Okay, and in this Hartsburgite is that depleted residuum that you leave behind when you make oceanic crust, right? Which has a huge amount of olivine as opposed to basalt, the oceanic crust, which has no olivine, right? Is dominated by pyroxene and garnet. And that becomes really important in terms of the earth, right? And so uh, in terms of the dynamics of the earth. And it becomes, so unfortunately, I'm going to skip all this, but uh, hopefully you can um, I be able to put this in. Let, let me put it this way. What happens is that the presence of all these minerals that evolve, whose phase assemblages evolve as a function of temperature as well as pressure, means that the effective thermal expansion of the system sometimes becomes negative. That was the point of the previous uh, all oh, right, I can't show previous slides right there. And the fact that it becomes negative means that now you no longer have convection, right? Um, so let me see if I can skip ahead. Okay, so, so just take that on faith. We can go through it in a little bit in a minute. Here is a map. So this is a phase diagram now as a function of pressure and temperature, not just pressure and composition, right? And the contours in the back are the thermal expansivity, okay? And what you can see is that the thermal expansivity is radically negative uh, at very high temperatures. The reason being that the phase assemblage has changed dramatically. What that means is that this will have an impact on convection and it will have an impact on the thermal evolution of the planet. And I am going to skip to that figure leave it here and then I guess open the floor for questions because I think it's almost three o'clock and I've gone on too long so okay thank you questions everyone feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question or type it into the chat window I'm gonna just uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to share um, this screen right here instead because it'll be easier. Um, so I think that should work. Okay. So while you think of questions, I'm just going to uh, reshare uh, my screen here. And, and, and there are starting to, and some questions in the chat window are starting to appear. Um, okay. So where was I? I was here uh, or not, I was here. So, okay. Um, Right, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, hi, Carolina, thanks for the fantastic, okay. So we said, uh, if you have thought about the future developments for the code, are you interested in community contributions or would you, would you prefer to just occasionally upload a new version? Are you interested in discussion with CIG about practices like choosing the appropriate license for the code to clarify what users are and are allowed to do with it? Um, the answer, Renee, is yes. Um, so in case I was going too fast, Renee is asking whether I, you know, were interested in contributions from people. The answer is yes. Um, and also, engaging with CIG. I should say that we did start a conversation with CIG years ago about doing this. At the time, the code, almost all the uh, subroutines for you know, singular value decomposition for some of the minimizations, they were almost all based on numerical recipes. And so we had to strip that out um, and you know, so that it, you know, it would be sort of new license compliant or whatever. And I think the code, is now completely numerical recipes free, uh, I think. Okay, so the, the answer is yes, we want to release it. We have one uh, sort of one um, concern, which I guess it's a concern for everybody, right? It's not about credit, obviously, it's about misuse, right? Um, because we've had some experiences where people want to uh, okay so the, the, the code so 
Lars spends a huge amount of time, you know, selecting, selecting is in the right word, but looking at the data, for example, for phase equilibria, for physical properties and making sure it, it's self-consistent and good and that you, you know, really, um, you know, sort of reproduce the experimental data, especially, right? And, uh, you know, some people have told us what they want to do is that just modify the uh, parameter files uh, almost at random and take any sort of data out there. But that will break the self-consistency of the code and uh, of the formulation itself, right? So if I go back, um, uh, so that's, that's the one concern. But maybe we should just, you know, not be concerned about that. But if I, um, am I sharing this? I'm not sharing this, am I? Um, okay, share, okay, so. Now I'm sharing, right? So if I, if I go back to this, right? Um, the, you know, the, 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 there's complete consistency. So if you do this, if you do this, uh, uh, so, so you see here that the individual elastic constants are uh, the second derivative uh, of the, uh, this should be energy, sorry, not the, the, the strength are here. Um, you, you know, you can do the same with the Gibbs free energy, right? So you can get an expression um, for the individual elastic constants with respect to, you know, the second derivative of the uh, Gibbs free energy with respect to the compliance tensor. Um, and so, you know, there's complete self-consistency. So if you now start, you know, putting data that won't be consistent with the phase equilibria, it just, it can break, you know, the power of the code. So I, I guess that's my concern. I think Lars is slightly less concerned about that. Um, uh, so, but anyway, that was a long answer to say yes to everything you said, um, Renee. <laughs> uh, that wasn't it. Um, right there, I just, uh, just wanna see the chat, right, okay. I, I think over email, so John asks, in terms of engaging the community with Hefesto, do you prefer discussion over email or on GitHub? I, I think email. At this point, is really beta in terms of GitHub. I mean, it just, the code isn't beta, but putting it there is, you know, that are th in, in the code has almost no documentation, right? <laughs> That's a slightly problematic. And, uh, and so, um, you know, we would prefer over email, that way we can sort of slowly build the user base, I think, and sort of make sure that people are comfortable with what it does and how it does it. Now, I guess Lorraine asked the same thing. Okay, so if people wanna ask, by the, okay, so Sarah asked, um, uh, could you clarify the similarities difference of Hefesto as compared to MELS and Perplex? Okay, so uh, MELS is, uh, was built for something completely different, right? Which was really for petrological reasons and MELS was built to, you know, to sort of predict melting. So we don't have melting yet. We will hopefully soon, uh, uh, you know, based on the same idea of fundamental thermodynamic relations. So MELS doesn't do that. MELS does the, you know, the phase, uh, it, it doesn't, it hasn't been, it doesn't have the physical property self-consistent with the uh, 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 physical area and the equation of state formulation is very different. It's not based on uh, Helmut's finite strain, but uh, the Binet equation of state. So there are some differences and, you know, we think ours, it's, you know, a sort of a more robust uh, theoretical formulation, but it really melts was built for low pressure, not for high pressure as well, and really built to, you know, uh, sort of, explore rocks. Now, Perplex has been expanded a great deal. It was also built to do metamorphic petrology, so uh, shallower pressures. Um, there, I think, I'm pretty sure that he has um, now, uh, you know, his uh, phase equilibria and physical properties are self-consistent. I should say Jamie and Lars interact a great deal, and so anytime we release a new parameter set, you know, they're always sort of uh, communicating with each other. Um, and that the, we think the, the uh, I mean, of, of course, Perplex has been released and anybody can use it. Um, the, there, because it also has our parameters for high pressure, the high pressure stuff is quite good. We think that our phase equilibria is slightly more robust. Um, it's uh, less noisy uh, in terms of the phase boundaries. Uh, Paul Ginsberg asked, um, Ah, 
is there any way to account for potential sluggish kinetics? No. I, I, okay. In phase transitions or reactions leading to metastable phases. Okay. So I should say this is an equilibrium thermodynamics code at the moment. Um, there really is no good kinetics theory out there. I, okay. So, so let me just step back just for a second here, right? Okay, um, I have written here, hopefully you can see it, equilibrium and transport, right? So the properties that are in, you know, a lot of the properties that are important for convection, like uh, viscosity and uh, thermal diffusivity, and so they're transport properties. Those are in equilibrium thermodynamic properties, so they're a lot hard that there's no theory to do that. Kinetics is the same. Um, there are some systematics and there's some things you could do. So one thought I had, actually this was at a cider a couple of years ago, is that to use, let me see if I can show you this, just a sec. No, that's the wrong one. Um, I wanna show you. So one thought that I had is to use the Gibbs free energy minimization surface as a way to identify metastability. So that's a thought I had and we, we kind of started to look at that uh, at Cider, but then lots of things intervene, including moving from London to here. So, okay, so here we go. Can, um, can you tell me if you can see this? Yes. Yes, you can. Okay, so what you see here is this is the phase diagram as before, right? Um, and it's the atomic fraction on the left and uh, sorry, on the y-axis. And on the x-axis is the number of the quasi-Newton iteration. It, it does the, the minimization better now, but and you see the phase boundaries in blue, right? And they're a little bit jaggedy, right? Um, the red is the Gibbs free energy. And it's, uh, you know, how the Gibbs free energy goes to its minimum value at the particular sort of P and T point. Uh, but it has, it, it has uh, steps, right? Terraces. It has, and it's a 3D surface. So it would have, you know, some pits and valleys. And my thought is that potentially we could use that to identify metastability, but I haven't really, you know, we haven't really thought much beyond that. Um, okay, so Rene asks, um, okay, so Rene says, thanks for the explanation, I understand your concerns. There's a wide range from a completely closed to completely open community, and I'm sure there is a point that addresses uh, your concerns. Okay, yes, so that's something that probably we should talk about, uh, you know, separately. Okay, Anthony. Okay. Oh, hi. And I think we've met before. Hi. Thank you for your time. So if one wants to try their hands on Hephaesto, is it possible to get the M310516 parameter file? Okay. So how it's, this is a compromise. Happy to give you 251010, which is published. Um, the 310516, it's been superseded at the moment. It's never published. It has been superseded. And I think part of the reason not to give it out is that when it hasn't been published, it means that not all the tests have been done, right? It's very stable. It gives you good phase equilibrium, good physical properties. But, you know, sometimes it, there might be a sneaky phase coming in. Uh, there might be some sort of slightly weird behavior that you, uh, is it real? Is it not real? Um, so that's one reason not to give them out. So just not to, you know, put in errors uh, out there. But 251010 is super tested. It's what's in perplex. So yes, we're happy to give that out. Um, and then John, again, John asks uh, a very general question. Do you have thoughts on the future direction of how codes like Festo and mental convection will be integrated or integrated? Oh, what a great question, John. Thank you. That lets me go to the, uh, to the bottom here. Okay, so we've been working with um, with Rene and Juliana in trying to implement uh, Hephaesto, well, the Hephaesto itself, uh, no, but the lookup tables that you get from Hephaesto with aspect in a good way. And, um, you know, Rene can pipe in uh, here, but let me show you uh, something from here that it's very important. Okay, so first of all, you know, if you're here, you probably know that phase transitions interact with mantle dynamics. And okay, here's a very clear way in which they interact with mantle dynamics, okay? So what you see here is density, okay, in the black. Um, the blue is a thousand K adiabat, the density along the thousand K adiabat. The red is along the 1600 K adiabat, okay? 
here is whopping negative thermal expansion, right? So the opposite of what you'd expect, and that should stop convection, okay? So you would think, this is a multi-mineral assemblage, so this is pyrolite, this is not just olivine, right? Uh, you would think that that would lead to layering. Uh, but it turns out that it didn't. And so we started questioning why that was. And then we started thinking of a few other things. And this comes to this uh, figure right here, which is the thermal expansion as a function of uh, pressure and temperature. Um, so hopefully you can all see this, right? Um, 24 GPA is the Bridgmanite transition, right? That's the 660 discontinuity, the one that gives you the whopping negative thermal expansion. And if I didn't tell you, you would be hard pressed to find it, right? I, and it shows up as less than a line. You know, it's negative thermal expansion is minus six, right? And that's in the multi-mineral, right? Um, so it's huge, right? But it doesn't show up because it's really, really, really sharp. Okay, now, how do you capture that, right, uh, in a thermodynamic code? So aspect would seem poised, right, because it has, um, you know, adaptivity, uh, mesh refinement, and so on. And Paul Tackley has a paper from all the way back in 94 in which he looked at the effect of the sharpness of the transition on the flow. And in fact, the sharper you make it, you know, the more it layers, right, even with, uh, a lower uh, clapper and soap. And by sharp, we mean sharp. This is less than a kilometer, right? Okay, so that, that's a big deal, right? Okay, so there's that aspect of it. So we started looking into this, let's do it. And then, you know, we ran into some problems, right? Uh, we ran into some problems and I hope that, um, you know, Renee can talk a little bit about this. Uh, but here's one of the problems. And let me see if I can show you this. This was a really simple scaling analysis. Okay, and this is the continuity. So this is mass conservation, okay? And here, mass conservation, right? I have kept in here the, uh, the time uh, part of the term, right? Uh, the, the derivative of the density with respect to time, right? That is not something you include even in a compressible code because why would you? That, you know, it's uh, not, uh, well, it, it changes things a lot, right? Okay, but if you do this very simple scaling, you use the chain rule, uh, it just doesn't show the value. It use the chain rule right here, right? Um, so that you get d rho, dz, dz, dt, and then you, know, you have these other terms. dz, dt is just the velocity of the flow, just like here, just like here. Okay, but then you know, this part is delta rho phase divided by z, which is the width of the phase transition, and this is the delta rho that you know, sort of dries the flow and so on. Okay, so what you find is when you, and these are some typical values, some typical length scale, say 3,000 kilometers of the mantle, delta rho of uh, 100 kilograms per meter cubed. I didn't put the unit, sorry. Um, I was experimenting with LaTeX on Keynote. <laughs> um, and this is the width of the phase transition. This is whoppingly big uh, phase transition. It's certainly not one kilometer. Anyway, the bottom line is that this term, this term becomes huge right, is much bigger at a phase transition, which would mean you cannot ignore this term right here. Okay, so that's one of the things that we, we found when we were, um, uh, when Rene and Julian and so on, we were working together on this. So, so that was problematic and, you know, they came up with some great solutions that unfortunately didn't work. And so now we're rethinking it all together and they came to visit recently. And so we are reformulating everything in terms of entropy. And in entropy, you don't have this huge discontinuities that you get uh, if you do this in terms in the normal sort of PT space. And so, but that requires uh, reformulating the code to do the calculations in terms of entropy. Um, but Lars has done that. Um, and so we are uh, in the process of figuring that out. Um, and Rene had this great uh, presentation already at uh, AGU where, you know, including some of these terms to do the compressible convection uh, correctly um, will be really important. So, it's super long answer, but I guess the bottom line is that we think this is really important. We think that having phase transitions is going to change the dynamics of the mantle, even in a multi-mineralic assemblage, in a way that um, 
you know, I think we haven't understood before. I could be wrong, uh, but I think there's something there that it's uh, pretty profound. And now I have one last question, I guess, uh, so far from Sarah Oliva. Um, you briefly showed a seducting slide animation one of the slides. Was that a geodynamic model that integrating changes slide material from FS to output? Oh, I wish I could say that. No, the answer is no. Uh, but I'll show it anyway because it's pretty. Um, and what it is is just having uh, the 660 phase transition uh, with uh, a strong viscosity jump at 660. More questions, anyone? If not, um, since it's already um, it's well, already ten minutes past, thank you, Carolina, for the excellent presentation. That was fascinating, and to see the details of Festo. Thank you again. Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, we didn't get to the fun stuff uh, of applying uh, of applying Festo to thermal evolution, but. You know, stay tuned. That paper should be coming out soon. So, another webinar in, in a year or two. <laughs> uh, so, there is one more question. Should I should I answer it? Uh, oh yes, please do. I um, may have missed you. it, but how does this relate to Christensen and UN eighty four? Right. So, uh, Christensen and UN. Uh, so they looked at the effect of one phase transition, which was at the time the perovskite um, forming reaction. Right. Um, and uh, they just for a slab, right? They were looking at that subducted slab and they were using the phase function formulation that Frank Richter had initially developed in, I don't know, 77, 78, uh, something like that, which is, you know, the phase buoyancy parameter. So you uh, sort of parameterize uh, the change in density uh, and, uh, you know, how sharply that happens um, and sort of an effective thermal expansion to account for the latent heat release. Um, so, so that is, you know, one end uh, member, you know, and that's, those papers are fantastic. The physics are so well explained. They're amazing. And so I would recommend everybody to read those papers, uh, those two papers of Christensen and Ewan. And uh, the, the way this is different, this is thermo, you know, this is the full thermodynamics. There are no approximations. There's, and you, the way we would do it in aspect is would be to read in the lookup table and uh, then, you know, basically at every PT point, use the actual value that it should have given the ball composition from the lookup table. Well, at this time there really are no more, more questions. Thank you again, Carolina. Okay, lovely. And uh, yes, yeah, so give uh, you know the GitHub thing a, a, a try and then contact us by email. You will have to, uh, to get the parameter set and also uh, you know, to probably to compile. Um, you know, it depends on a lot of different libraries, which I didn't mention. And so you, know, you might need some help. So So thank you all.